So look, I thought what I'd begin is talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more abstractly, uh, on the general problems of uh, providing information, uh, and then come a little bit more specifically to the particular problems of, of this crisis. Uh, the distinctive aspect of information of the kind that Anya was mentioning is that it's, you call it, you kind of call it a public good. Everybody benefits if there's good information, just like everybody benefits from good government. But because everybody benefits, nobody has an incentive to supply it. So there is inevitably an undersupply of public goods. And so this, in a way, is the fundamental problem of, uh, of getting a supply of disinterested good information about uh, our economy, about society, about anything. There are strong private incentives for distorted information. So there are strong incentives, incentives if you have a political agenda to get information out about why it is that the stimulus is not going to work, even if it's not true. Uh, advertisers have an incentive to get out information about why, uh, you know, Taking out a 30% interest rate mortgage is a good idea, and you'll enjoy it. Uh, so uh, you have a lot of private incentives for distorted information, but not enough incentives on the other side to get the kind of information that is essential for making society function. The particular business model, if you want to call it that, that we've used for the most part in the United States is a you might call it an accidental model. It's one where information is supplied as a byproduct of advertising. So you deliver a newspaper, the model of the newspaper, for the most part, not all of them, but for the most part, the newspapers survive economically by selling advertising. But people read the advertising in part because there are all these other news. But obviously, with that business model, there's a problem. If you're supplying information and it's being financed by advertisers, you have to be a little bit tame to the advertisers. You have to be, say, sensitive to their concerns. So if, the, uh, if, if one of your major advertisers are the banks, you're not likely to say that the banks are engaged in corruption and, and exploitation and, and all those things. And so, in a way, the basic business model of, of news delivery in the United States for a very long time was uh, inherently biased. Uh, the, um, it's different in different countries. I mean, it, it is interesting that in some countries, the parties, each of the major political parties, have their own newspapers. That has its own problem, because then each of the newspapers is biased in their own way, but at least you get an array of biases. Uh, but uh, uh, but nobody in, in that context, nobody really takes anything as 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 truthful or honest. It's just what is the particular agenda that they're they're uh, pursuing. There's another problem uh, though for for most media. Uh, they're competitive, but being competitive means you, know, you succeed by access to access to stories. And who has the information? Well, typically, if you start thinking about what are the, who, who has the information, people usually who have information have an incentive for you to have a, tell their story in a particular way. So access to information that would allow you to break a story, to be on the forefront, requires a trade. Economists think that you know everything is involved in this exchange. And the particular exchange is they give you information in return for you giving them correct coverage. And so the 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 way that news gets transmitted from those who have information to the general public is almost inherently biased. I saw that very strongly in, when I was in, was in Washington. Um, I could tell. Uh, when I you know, read a story about, say, uh, a cabinet meeting or something, who would leave the story? Uh, you could tell it first because if you read the story, you knew whose side they were explaining. Uh, 
Uh, and and you know we have some argument and and and, and there there would be a, a alternative views and one view would get predominance over another. They would, they would try to give a balance, a little bit of balance. One story would be on the on the 14th page, and the other one would be on the first page. Uh, but they would then say, well, we gave both views. Uh, but then you start looking if you follow this uh, closely over time. You then begin to understand that some reporters are owned by certain people in the administration. Uh, they wouldn't call it that, but that's really a more accurate description of what was going on. And this is true in almost most of the media, very true in the New York Times. I saw very, very clearly that, that there were certain reporters up that you knew who they were talking to all the time. And then if you have any doubts about this, what we call uh, exchange, you would see episodically a, um, a puff piece, we call them, uh, telling, glorifying the hero of the leaker. Uh, the guy who's giving the information would be uh, uh, described in one article or another as really the brains behind the administration or the strong man in the administration, the guy who is the bringing on the idea. So it was a very clear. Uh, uh, it was not only that his ideas were being pushed, but his person, his person was being pushed. So this is really an essential nature of, of the media. Now in business journalism, it's even worse because you're not going to get access to uh, the business other than the press release if you don't treat them well. Um, one, one episode, uh, something in between a, a, a story of, of uh, uh, a major uh, agency, a government, it doesn't claim to be an agency in the government, but it is, uh, where the news reporter had uh, reported um, basically his, their, their view of what they were doing, uh, the chairman's view of what they were doing, uh, in, a, in, in a favorable light consistently. And then one day um, he wrote a story that was critical. And they gave a little bit of a, I think, a fairly accurate depiction of some of the controversies and some of the some of the darker side of what was going on. And three weeks later, later, he rather than reporting these front page stories in, from Washington about what was going on in this important institution, he was reporting car sales in Detroit. <laughs> uh, he had basically been denied access. And once you don't deny access, you might as well be describing car sales in Detroit. Uh, so uh, this is, a, 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 I think, a fundamental problem when you have information that is uh, essentially, uh, even if it's supposed to be public, it's privatized. And therefore, you, you, you have an exchange of that private information to somebody else to make it public, but then you, you destroy it. Well, uh, in uh, the crisis, this particular crisis, things were more complicated, or more covering for some, to the, this, these problems I've just described, there was one more problem, which was the banks worked extraordinarily hard, hard to make sure that no one knew what was going on. So they engaged in activities that were trying to make sure that the regulators, the investors, the shareholders didn't know what was going on. Because if they did know what was going on, they wouldn't be allowed. So with such active engagement in non-transparency, it's not surprising that it was very difficult for the media to, to uncover it. Because you know, it, 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 it was not an accident that it was not transparent. What I found so amusing is some of the players, major players in this non-transparency, were those who had been critical of East Asia for being non-transparent. Uh, and uh, I suppose they, they had, uh, they, they were sensitive to the issue of non-transparency because they'd been uh, engaged in it and they were worried that East Asia might be outdoing them, but there's absolutely no doubt who won that contest. American <laughs> banks really outdid everybody in non-transparency. So um, that made it very difficult. And there were two reporters, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Mark Pittman, because he was one of the reporters who uh, really did the correct
forensic counting, you know, took a took, took the attitude that there's something funny going on here. Used every tool, including the Freedom of Information Act, and some of the things that he died about a year ago. And it's so interesting. Some of the Freedom of Information Act requests are just now coming out of things that he requested to it. It's taken a year, and we still get information from things that he, he requested. And what's so surprising to me is how few, how few reporters were using the tools that they have on the Freedom of Information Act. I mean, I'll give you one example. Uh, the uh, role of the Fed in um, uh, the bailout of AIG, and where the money went. Uh, Bernanke uh, uh, and Geiger did not want anybody to know. Uh, you know, they always are going to claim, like everybody in that context, state secret. You know, it will lead to the end of the world as we know it, that people do. But of course, we know why they don't want us to know, because it turned out that the largest recipient was Goldman Sachs of the AIG money, and the second largest recipient, and the third, I think maybe even the fourth, were foreign banks. And the notion that the U.S. Federal Reserve was using its money, back to our taxpayer money, to bail out foreign banks, might have had a political reaction. <laughs> so the, the fact was that, that uh, we now know why, that, that why it was they didn't want us to know. And he was one of the few reporters that used the tools that we had to, to try to get at this. Um, so finally, let me make uh, two final comments about why in crises like this it's so uh, difficult. Um, uh, and that is a combination of uh, psychology and sociology. One of them is that when you have a, a bubble like the current one, everybody uh, joins the herd, including the reporters. So they got taken up in, in the psychology of, of hysteria, of the bubble. And it's very difficult for reporters to separate themselves from society. They are part of society. So if everybody is, is, is uh, believing that there's a bubble, it's very hard for them to stand back and say, no, there's not a bubble. And so one of the important roles of the press should always be one of a skeptic. And, and, say, and that's always difficult. And that's related to the, to the second comment, more, more of a sociology and, 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 and psychology, uh, and that is everybody likes to be the cheerleader, to get the attention of being a cheerleader. And the, you know, the, the, the uh, famous uh, story, the, 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 the wonderful clips of the CNBC or of uh, uh, Yeah. Uh, of, you know, you, you can feel the enthusiasm of, uh, of, of the stock market going up. And somebody who, just, think about the other side, if you're going to, uh, on one, the, uh, the writer or the newscaster wants people to listen. So think about the people people want to listen to. The people want to be told that they just made the worst mistake of their life in buying these things that are going to break. Or would they rather hear, boy, are you smart? <laughs> And so there's a really natural tendency for the listeners to want to hear good news. They don't want to hear bad news. So if you present good news, you just don't people who walk stock, they're going to make a lot of money, they're going to listen to you. And if you have a market-based model of listeners, you're going to do better. And your boss is going to give you higher pay and going to give you more attention. So, the market model really in this context has some really fundamental problems that even if journalists wanted to accurately describe what's going on, he might find himself without readers. Um, I think you've raised a couple of points that fit nicely 